All right, so uh, start with a show of hands. Uh, hands up if you would like to fail more. Oh, a couple of brave hands at the back. A few more joining the bandwagon. All right, hands up if you would like to innovate more. Okay, you must have heard lots of uh, expressions and, and phrases about the fact that the only way to innovate is to fail. And so I think one of the things that holds many of us back from being able to innovate more is the time we take learning that our failures are in fact failures. So one of the great things that pretotyping can do is help us get from idea to failure more quickly so that the ones that don't become failures can progress and become successes and you can do a lot more of them because you're not wasting all that time nurturing your failures for too long before you learn whether that's what they are. And there's a very important law of failure which is that most new things fail. If you look at all the data in any area, you'll see that most new ideas, most new projects, most new businesses, in fact, fail. Uh, if you look on the um, App Store, uh, Google or iOS, about 90% of the mobile apps there make no money whatsoever, um, barely discovered. 80% of new products uh, fail in the marketplace, typical um, consumer goods products. Uh, four out of five startups lose their investors' money. Uh, clearly fewer than that within the BC portfolio, but still, uh, there are some that fail. Um, and if it's a truly innovative idea rather than just a me too idea, then the, the odds are even worse. So if we can get through the large volume of things that we need to test much more quickly, we can get to more of our successes uh, more easily. So uh, this is a nice bit of data that supports that. Many of you will know of Nielsen. Nielsen, the um, big market research group. Uh, they did a study about a year ago where they uh, tracked uh, some it's not on there, but some huge number, like 10,000 new product launches uh, across all categories in the, um, in the grocery sector, and just looked at what happened a year later. Uh, and you can see here that actually something like 80% of them you would effectively call failures. Uh, and uh, you know, that's in an area which is pretty well funded and pretty well researched and so on. Um, and then if you look at those and look at the different way they were categorized in terms of which ones were uh, just uh, me too or seasonal products or just line extensions, the numbers that were actually breakthrough is very small. So you can see there that uh, um, if you're going to do a really innovative breakthrough idea, the chances of failure uh, are pretty high. And what's interesting as well is that typically the failure <coughs> is not because the execution was poor. And I think it's very true that um, uh, a great execution is worth, uh, uh, worth a number of uh, points of IQ. But in fact, all the studies show that execution will not rescue an idea, an innovation, a product, if there's something wrong with the product concept or idea in the first place. And interestingly, it happens even to BC sometimes. Uh, and even to all of the best companies. So somebody very kindly did a study uh, on Pinterest a while ago to look at all of the products in the Google graveyard. Uh, so this is all of the things that Google has launched, taken to market, invested significant resources in, significant uh, energy trying to, uh, uh, to, to keep them going, and then they were ultimately killed off. And I think one of the things that Google has actually done better in the last couple of years since Larry Page came back as the CEO is to kill off the failures more quickly and stop uh, um, putting resources behind limping products. Um, now obviously Google's quite competitive and they were worried that this was painting them in a bad light but they were very heartened to see that somebody had done a similar piece of work uh, on the Microsoft morgue uh, which you'll see is even more uh, crowded and highly populated. Um, so. Uh, it happens to the best companies, happens to the biggest companies, and it even happens to uh, some brilliant minds that we know are particularly good at this kind of stuff. Uh, you look at three of the uh, biggest uh, failures from Steve Jobs, who otherwise had some phenomenal successes. Um, so the big question that comes out of that is, why the failure? <laughs> so why the failure? Why so many failures coming from these great companies and from these great uh, innovative leaders? And I think a real insight from this is that Typically, when you have a flop, it's a failure in launch or in operations or in premise. And there are different ways you can structure the kinds of failures, but this is one model which I think is quite interesting. And what pretotyping all, is all about is understanding if your premise is right before you go and put tons of energy and effort 
into your launch and into your operations. Because it's very tempting for us as business leaders, as marketeers, as executives, to plow a huge amount of our own personal energy and our businesses' resources and money into trying to improve the launch and improve the execution to try and keep a product whose basic premise isn't quite right alive. And that's the biggest enemy of an efficient organization that's trying to build multiple launches into successes. So, what we come up with, what well, Alberto Savoy that uh, Manoj mentioned, who's the kind of originator of this whole pre-to-typing idea, has come up with is a framework that says, well, you've got an innovator's uh, magic Venn diagram, three magic circles, where if you can be in the middle point here, you've got success. And those three things are desirability, uh, feasibility, and viability. So desirability is, does anybody want it? Then feasibility is, can we make it? And viability is, can it make any money? Now, it sounds very, very simple, but often we don't think clearly about those different elements of something that's going to make, uh, make a successful product or proposition launch. But what's, I think, equally interesting is that we spend most of our time typically in these two circles down here. If you think about the amount of time you spend in terms of uh, can we make it, so you think about all of the, uh, all of the Gantt charts that we do and all of the product, project plans and, uh, and all of the prototypes and so on, that's can we make it. And can it make money? We spend all this time working on cash flow projections and P&L forecasts and financial modeling and so on. But how often do we skate over the do they want it based upon anecdote or our own gut feeling or a few focus groups? So the question is, if we can get better at this, then we can make the whole thing work much better. But getting good at this is hard because typically research fails us. So pretotyping to the rescue is the bold promise uh, of this presentation. And we'll start with a definition of pretotype, pretotyping. So the idea behind this is make sure you're building the right it before you work on building it right. We tend to spend most of our efforts working on building it right uh, and take on faith the fact that the it that we started with is something that the market actually wants. Uh, so how do you know if you've got the right it? Well, the first thing is don't ask. Literally, don't ask. Don't rely purely on asking people whether you've got the right it. Because if you just ask people, then you'll get a bunch of false positives and a bunch of false negatives. So ideas and questions just lead you in problem because you, they, they exist in a place called Thoughtland where people are, uh, are, are intellectualizing the issue and they are trying to uh, transpose themselves into a place where this product <coughs> or service might be relevant to them. Um, and you throw out an idea and you get a bunch of opinions back and they can be very, very misleading. So Thoughtland's a place where every idea uh, no matter how poor, can be a winner. So think of the research that went into Webvan. Who is old enough to remember Webvan? A few people here? So Webvan was a precursor to Amazon a long time ago, back in the, uh, the late 90s in uh, Silicon Valley. A bunch of uh, ex-bankers decided that the world was ready for home shopping, and uh, they went out and they raised billions of dollars. They had a billion dollars initially in um, uh, venture capital money, and they built refrigerated warehouses, and they bought, uh, and they bought tons of uh, vans, and they hired thousands of people, and they launched this thing based on a bunch of uh, research focus groups where you said, they said to homeowners, if we could deliver your shopping and save you the hassle of, uh, of having to go and pick it up yourself, would that be a service that you'd want? And they all said yes. But in that thought land, they couldn't think through the logical practicalities of not being in when the delivery came uh, and uh, having to take time off work to collect the delivery and so on because it was a new concept. And so the, the proposition at the time, it was much earlier then than it is now with, uh, with Ocado, uh, was wrong. And yet the thought land experiment of would you buy this that they did in their research groups gave them a very uh, expensive false positive. So you've got to try and avoid this. Yes. Um, and also, you can get false negatives. I mean, how many, when they first thought of Twitter, thought, oh, 140 characters, send me my phone, and that's going to be a multi billion dollar business? I certainly didn't. Uh, and I'm sure um, that most people in research focus groups would have said exactly this. But by getting it out there in the marketplace and testing it, uh, they found they had something special. So, 
The idea of prototyping is to get out of thought land and get into a place where you go from opinions to data, where you go from uh, questions to actions, and where you go from ideas to prototypes. But you're still probably thinking, what the heck is a prototype? Um, and probably the best way to uh, explain that is to illustrate it with an example from a very early on uh, situation of prototyping. Um, so I'll take you back to uh, the uh, early 80s, I think. IBM at the time was the preeminent corporation in the world. Uh, it was the leader in mini computers and mainframe computers, and it was the leader in electric typewriters. Both markets were constrained. Mini computers because uh, it was only for big corporations, and electric typewriters because the only people who really typed at the time were secretaries and journalists. Um, and if you were a business person, then you uh, dictated your stuff and your secretary typed it up. And so they had this genius idea that they could put together these two centers of excellence that they had and create something that they could bet the company on. And the idea was uh, speech to text. So they could use the computer processing power that they had in their mainframes and their, uh, and their software, and they could use their typewriting heritage to uh, go into and develop a market which would explode the potential use for typing to a much, much wider audience and give a lot more people reasons to buy expensive processing machines. And so they genuinely had a board meeting where they discussed betting the company on this initiative. Now, if you think about a typical prototyping world, the way you'd approach this is to say, right, let's see if this can work. We'll put 100 engineers for six months on developing a uh, minimum viable product that will interpret people's voice and turn it into text and then see if people like that. Okay? Very expensive, quite difficult to judge. The other way you can try and evaluate it is through research. And you can get a bunch of business people into a room and say, if you could speak to this thing, and if the perfect typing came up here, and you didn't have to uh, worry about uh, your grumpy secretary uh, typing it out, or the cost of that situation, would you buy it? And again, you can expect what kind of answer they did. But what they did is something very clever. They got Mr. Smith to come in to a room, and he was confronted by a microphone. Okay? And they gave him a text written up, and they said, uh, um, well, let's see how this machine works. And there was a screen in front of him. And he started speaking and he said, uh, okay, dear Mr. Jones, in reply to your letter, and magically up on this screen came this text. And they go, bloody hell, that's good. But what was actually happening, as you're all guessing right now, not that expensive process of building the, uh, the prototype, what was actually happening was not this. What was happening was this. This wire went to a set of headphones attached to Mrs. Andrews, who was sitting in another room, and she was typing onto her own keyboard exactly what she heard, and it was coming up on his screen. So that was the prototype. You haven't built the product that works, but you've uh, emulated <coughs> the exact functionality uh, of the thing that you were trying to build. Uh, and so the businessman got exactly the experience that he would have got from something that had been fully built, but without the cost of building it. And what was particularly interesting in this is that while he was wowed the first time the few characters came on the screen, after a few minutes of this, he was saying, OK, dear Mr. Jones, in reply to your letter dated 12, 7, no, hang on, hang on, 7, uh, slash, backslash, oh, no, hang on, um, OK. And then his mouth going dry and then worrying about confidential information and so on. Got to a point where... where in the research, at the beginning of the process, in answer to this question, it was about 80% positive. 80% of the business people said, in response to, if we uh, had this speech-to-text thing, would you buy it? After they tried it out in this uh, setup scenario, the data completely flipped over. And as a result, IBM changed from a bet the company project to a sideline project, and they ran this uh, as a, a little um, via voice initiative, which they carried on with, but it never got to a point where they were investing billions in it. And so that was the, an illustration of the idea of, of pretotyping. Um, and, uh, and I think hopefully you can get the idea of how this might work. So next example is the original Palm Pilot. Who remembers one of these? I bought this on eBay for eight quid. It didn't come with a charger, so I can't show you, can't show you it working. 
Um, but I had one of these at the time as well. And uh, what's particularly interesting about this is the story around its origin. So um, uh, I forget the, the, the guy's name who was the inventor of this, but uh, uh, he'd had some uh, challenges in a previous launch with the uh, grid pad, which uh, had been developed and lots of expensive uh, development work had gone into it, but it never really got the market they'd expected because its form factor wasn't right. It was too big and cumbersome to be used in the situations they'd expected. So when he had the idea of doing a, uh, a little palm pilot, the idea was uh, all I really need, really need on my daily uh, work is uh, contacts, calendar, and to-do list. Um, if I could just get that electronically stored, then I think that could really work. But to convince, well, because he thought the major barrier to get over was the form factor, he wanted to prototype the form factor. So rather than, again, building expensive electronics, he literally got a block of wood that you can see there. And this thing is actually in the Computer History Museum in Palo Alto right now, that block of wood with a few bits of photocopied paper stuck to it and a little wooden toothpick. And he carried it around in his breast pocket like this for a few weeks. And uh, play along with me, right? So, um, oh, um, we said we'd meet next week. Um, what's that, what day are you free? Thursday. Thursday. And he would tap away on his piece of wood with his toothpick. Um, OK, that's great, uh, 3 o'clock. And um, uh, what's your phone number? Oh, wow. Yeah, OK, you tap it in. Uh, and, and he would just see whether he felt like that uh, engagement worked. And he also optimized the size of this so it fitted in his chest pocket easily. So the previous one was a, uh, was a bit wider. His pockets are bigger than mine. So you can see another example there of the uh, prototype uh, idea coming to the fore. And so thinking about prototype versus prototype, a prototype typically has investment of hours or days. The main question is, would I use it? Would I use it like this? Uh, would people use it? And the, the deliverable is a working thing that pretends to be what it is. Whereas prototyping, uh, it's typically days, weeks, or months. The main question is, can we build it and will it work? Rather than, will I use it? Uh, and the deliverable is something that's functionally uh, similar to the, uh, to, the, to the finished article. Um, in context, a bit more data, I'll share that with you later in the handout. Um, and a more expansive uh, definition of this is validating the market appeal and actual usage, how it will be used, uh, of a potential new product objectively and with the smallest possible investment of time and money. And that's the critical thing here, is we can go from having an idea to having a good understanding of whether it will be used, or more importantly, whether it won't be used and we can kill it with a much smaller investment of time and money than you can do with a typical uh, prototyping process. So building the right it before building it right. I'll give you some examples. So uh, the Mechanical Turk. Has anyone heard the story of the Mechanical Turk? So. Um, uh, I won't get all the historical details right, but there was a uh, competition um, four or five hundred years ago uh, in uh, Central Europe where they were um, looking at these new inventions of uh, mechanics and engineering. And they were supposed to come to the, the king or the emperor and, and show off the things that they could do that were really cool. Uh, and one great inventor came along with a chess playing machine where there was a big box with a chessboard on the top and a mechanical uh, arm, and they managed to convince the courtiers that this thing could actually play chess uh, and uh, would play a decent game of chess. And what they'd done is they'd hidden a little Turkish chap in the box underneath, and they'd had this clever system of magnets where the pieces had magnets on the top, and therefore you could see the position of the pieces from underneath. Uh, and he was using uh, um, a little... Uh, puppet joystick thing to move the pieces around. So that's where the idea of Mechanical Turk comes from now. And if you go to search for Mechanical Turk on the internet right now, it will take you to an Amazon service where you can actually buy by the minute uh, humans to do uh, tasks that you typically get computers to do if you had built out the full functionality. Uh, so if you want to get um, your uh, data set transcribed into charts, for example, then you can go to Mechanical Turk, upload your uh, your project and a bunch of people in uh, India or Indonesia or Brazil will bid for it and they'll do that work for you. And effectively they are the Turks in the box pretending to be computers uh, and doing the work. So that's a very early idea of a prototype principle which is still alive today. Um, uh, we also uh, have talked about um, uh, the IBM example. 
Uh, and another one of my favourite ones is the nationwide example. So um, I don't know if any of you are old enough to have invested in a TESA before there were ISAs around. But TESA was the uh, tax-exempt special sa savings uh, account, which the government introduced uh, as a way to try and encourage people to invest. And uh, those things were around in the, in the late 90s, and you had to hold them for five years in order to get your tax break. Now, at the end of the first five years, a bunch of people's money was maturing. Uh, and this was the late 90s then. And uh, the internet was just starting to be relevant. And a number of the banks thought, well, if we had a way of people reinvesting their maturing TESA money online, we might capture a decent proportion of that money. Um, but none of the banks had the wherewithal to actually build the system to do this. So most of them missed the opportunity, except for Nationwide. They had this very clever idea of doing a Mechanical Turk type system. And what they did is that they put up a web page which said, uh, maturing Tesla accounts, reinvest them with us, decent interest rates, uh, slick process, put your details in here, give us your uh, name, details, account numbers, amount, and so on. Uh, web page up there. They got lots and lots of usage of that. And what was behind the scenes was when you press submit on that web page, it generated a physical paper fax which came out in their call centre in Newbury, uh, and the pieces of paper were handed to little old ladies who typed it into the mainframe system. And so that was a brilliant idea of Mechanical Turk, which cost nothing to develop, but proved the market for this kind of thing, so they could then justify the, uh, the IT resource to code this up and make it proper uh, for subsequent uh, um, maturity dates. So, and they won a massively increased share of the uh, reinvestment market because of that, versus their competition. So this is Mechanical Turk, and what I'm going to go through is a number of different pre-totyping archetypes, if you like, uh, which is worth having in your head because they're different ways of trying to approach the challenges that you have. So first one, Mechanical Turk. Um, next one is a fake door. So it's called a fake door because it looks like a door, and it looks like there's a great thing behind the door, but when you open the door, there's nothing there. But what we're really interested in is, did you try to open the door in the first place? So the obvious uh, fake door is the uh, Google AdWords ad which doesn't go to the thing that it promises. Unfortunately, um, Google's got a bit tighter in terms of their algorithms, making it harder to do this than it used to be. But you can do it with um, other online services. So Alberto wrote this book, or at least he was planning to write the book on pretotyping. Before he wrote the book, he wanted to figure out if anyone was going to buy the bloody thing. So he put up some Google ads uh, and did this and saw if anybody clicked on it. And only when he got a few thousand clicks did he think, OK, it's worth my bother, worth my effort to write the book. And so that's a great way of pretotyping the concept of a book. Um, and I know that some of you uh, were in the session that Zella King did last week uh, uh, on um, personal boardroom. And uh, she's now written a book, and she got some confidence to write the book by putting up uh, ads on the book concept before it was written. Um, Another example of a fake door, again, Alberto uh, was planning on doing some uh, seminar sessions on pretotyping uh, on campus at Stanford, near where he lives. Uh, but it's quite a hassle and actually quite expensive to secure a room and go through the university uh, bureaucracy and so on to get it um, endorsed as, uh, as an event on campus. So he put up flyers for an event on campus, stuck them on the notice boards, um, got a bunch of people registering, and then went to the administrators and said, uh, lots of people want to come to this course, you need to give me a room. Um, and so that was, again, another full store idea. Um, Next one is uh, another idea of fake dooring, sort of a hybrid fake door is crowdfunding. Uh, so um, when uh, Warner Brothers wanted to figure out whether they should do a, uh, a Veronica Mars film, they put it up on Kickstarter uh, and they got a bunch of backing. So again, you're, you're putting something up that doesn't exist yet, doesn't really exist, and seeing if the, uh, if the market is genuinely there. And the difference between this and market research is if you say to somebody, if we made this film, would you go and watch it? That's very different from, we're planning on making this film, give us 20 quid and we'll send you a ticket if we get enough money. It's a totally different level of commitment uh, to the proposition. And so people are not hypothesizing about uh, whether they might, they are saying that they will. Um, and then interestingly, you're seeing more and more companies, uh, corporates, are using these kind of crowdfunding things to understand the appetite for projects even within their corporations. 
So what IBM has done has given a, uh, a cohort of their employees within the organization um, $2,000 of monopoly money, uh, which they can then bid into projects which are proposed by other team members. And then only if they get sufficient funding from this money, uh, it means that there's enough uh, endorsement and support for that business around the organization, which I think is a neat idea. Um, Pinocchio is the next um, archetype, and this is where you uh, make something that doesn't actually do any of the job that you, you think it'll do, but it's, it's made of wood, it's kind of, it, it looks and feels, so you get the form factor uh, feedback that you would need. Um, next one is impersonator, uh, which I like this one. Um, so this is where you uh, take something that already exists that can impersonate the thing that you're looking to build. And uh, an example of this is Tesla. So uh, Tesla, uh, Elon Musk, um, great innovator and business uh, inventor, had taken a bunch of money out of PayPal and had this idea that the world could be a better place if uh, proper high-performance electric cars uh, were built. And he needed to get some validation from the market that people would actually buy a performance electric vehicle. Because at the time, electric vehicles were basically milk floats and buses uh, when he started his, his initiative. And so what he did is he uh, bought a Porsche. He stripped out all of the stuff, into all the engine and the drive chain and stuff from a Porsche. Uh, and then he um, molded uh, plastic components that would be about the same size and shape as the bits that you would need to put in to make an electric vehicle. Uh, and then he parked it outside the offices where rich people live and said, do you want to come see my new car? Um, if this was working, would you buy it? Uh, and so that was his, uh, his impersonator model. So people get a sense of what it would look like. And then actually he went one stage further and said, OK, you say you'll buy it. Uh, give me $5,000. I'll give it back to you if you, we don't complete. Um, but uh, put your $5,000 down and that gets you on the waiting list. And in fact, that's still the model they use today. So if you want to buy a Tesla S now, you have to go online and put your $5,000 down and then they'll tell you when you get to the front of the queue and they'll ask you for their full payment. So they're keeping that, uh, that process going. Um, next example of an impersonator. Uh, who knows what this is? Yes? Pudding. Pudding, okay. Well, it's not exactly pudding. What this is, is an impersonator pudding. So uh, James Avedick, who's the founder of Goo, um, when he started out, he wanted to understand whether it was worth his effort taking this hypothesis he had <coughs> that the market was ready for restaurant quality desserts for home entertaining. He wanted to know whether his hypothesis was strong enough to go and negotiate uh, manufacturing contract, contracts and negotiate supply contracts and do all of the work you need to get there. So what he did is he developed some packaging. There's another very interesting story about that, uh, which represented the brand. Um, he got two empty glass ramekins, stuck them in the packaging. That's what you got here. And then he stuck a few of these on the shelf in his local Waitrose and he hid around the corner. <laughs> And he just waited there spying on the uh, ladies and gents that were doing their shopping and to see if anybody would take one off the shelf. Because his hypothesis was that people would pay twice the going rate for a dessert if it looked really classy. Um, but the best, if you, you test that in research groups, every, you're going to get, always get a false positive on that kind of thing. People always want to look slightly more upmarket, slightly more generous, slightly more classy than they really are in focus groups. Um, so any marketeers in the room know that's the case. And so you have to put them in a real world situation. So by hiding this up on the shelf, he could see what actually happened and people put it into their baskets. And so then he would pop out and say, ah, I see you bought my pudding. I'm afraid there's no pudding in there, but can you tell me why you chose it and, uh, and got the group, the group there? And then he also, more importantly, had data to go to Waitrose to negotiate his listing because the supermarkets are notoriously uh, challenging to get listing space. But if you can say, well, I had 17 people take them off the shelf in just two hours in your Swindon store, um, then that's, uh, they're probably slightly pissed off with you in the first place for having hijacked their shelf space, but it's a great data point. Dan, can I just add to the set group for us that are on BC Build that uh, Harry, who many of you know, um, who was on the previous BC Build, his, his last few days working at Florian because he did, he did business with his brother who was making some pretty special ice cream. Excellent. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure James uh, for the next F there will, uh, will be sharing his uh, insights in this kind of process. 
Um, and the next one I really like is uh, what they did in Ikea. And the best way to illustrate this is with a video, which hopefully will be loud enough, because I think the only sound we've got is on my laptop. Yeah, on the rack over there. Oh. No. Sorry about that. So this oh, no worries. This is an IKEA, so you can just. I think oh. somebody just left them. So oh, for real? Have, yeah. So you have to take them. Huh? There's a whole stack of them back there, though. Really? Free wall hub day at IKEA. Right. <laughs> Uh, just online, eBay. Oh yeah, this oh, get yeah. anything online. This is actually I don't know. I used to like that one better though, but yeah, it's cleaner. Yeah, this, <laughs> no, I mean clean like it's like no stripes, you know, yeah. just plain. Yeah. Nice. I thought you was working here. I was, I was gonna say no, you know, no. Just myself. Yeah, no. Thanks though. I'm Justin, by the way. Enjoy. Nice to meet you. you need help, just let me know. Cool. Thanks, man. Let's get that audio. So slightly cheeky approach, but uh, effective nonetheless. So I think uh, the Wall Hub guys got really good insight into uh, whether people were going to take that off the shelves or not. Um, next thing is an MVP, a more uh, <laughs> traditional approach. And uh, uh, interestingly, Alberto would say that there's a lot of parallels between the MVP process and this, but uh, there are enough differences to make them uh, the two stand in their own right. Uh, and once Alberto had gone from the endorsement he got from the AdWords click that a uh, book of some sort was going to be valuable, uh, he then produced this, which is a 50-page uh, PDF, uh, which is as far as he's got, you can just download it for free. And so that's an MVP because his objective was to get the message out rather than to uh, make a lot of money. And I guess if uh, it sold or downloaded more of the PDF than it did, he might have gone and published uh, a full-blown book with a decent cover price. But again, that's uh, an MVP idea. Um, and then a, a one from my own experience at Google is that uh, with Google Glass, when the initial idea of Google Glass, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, was uh, discussed at a, uh, an executive meeting, about 45 minutes later, one of the engineers involved in the idea came back into the room with a piece of bent coat hanger wire around his head and a cell phone sellotape to the side just to demonstrate that the idea of having data in your peripheral vision is something that could have value. 
And so from there, they went on to uh, a slightly more functional prototype, which is a, uh, a cell phone, some safety specs, a power supply uh, in a backpack. You know, clearly not something that you're ever going to sell, but it's a, uh, a minimum viable product in terms of demonstrating the functionality. Uh, and then obviously it's gone to this um, uh, kind of form factor today. Where's it going next? Uh, and a question for another day. A question for another day. Uh, and then the next one is a one night stand, particularly in retail. This is pretty powerful. So if you have got uh, an idea in retail, the typical way it's approached is for the retail organization to figure out uh, how they need to reconfigure their stores. And they might roll it out through uh, you know, half a dozen test stores or even a nationwide uh, um, re reorganization and, and, and launch. But um, this was the idea of a one night stand was illustrated very nicely by Best Buy, where somebody had the idea that for the next big games console launch, so when it goes from Xbox 360 to Xbox One, for example, uh, there ought to be a really interesting market for uh, second hands. So if we can offer a trade in on the 360, uh, then we will win more of the market for the Xbox One. And so rather than reconfiguring their whole store and then redoing all the IT of the till systems and so on to have a trade encounter in a place that didn't carry it before, uh, they bought a tent, stuck it in the car park and put trade in and then put an ad in the local free sheet. And uh, when people came here, they uh, took the old things in, they checked them, they gave them a, a handwritten stamp note and said, take this to the till and you can redeem it for a discount on the new one. And so they managed to demonstrate through this test process that there was demand that people were engaged and to learn a lot more about the proposition. For example, that some people wanted to trade in today, but not buy today. They wanted some way to time store the money from the trade in uh, um, in case they could come back the following week with their son or their daughter. And so they uh, uh, changed it to a gift card process. And then they had to include uh, trading in of the games and the software that went with it. And so they learned a lot from this process that allowed them to build the fully fledged process in store, which they've now done and rolled out. So uh, to give my voice a little rest and get you guys uh, involved, let's uh, have some practice. So let's go back to one I mentioned earlier, uh, Webvan. So as I said before, the way Webvan launched was off the back of some research. Uh, they built a massive warehouse with some extraordinarily complex software to uh, move all of these SKUs around on carousels, to pick them into baskets, to put them into refrigerated vans, uh, and to take them to people's homes off the back of a very expensive website. So if they'd been armed with the toolkit of pretotyping, what might they have done differently? Any thoughts? They may have just taken orders over the phone and delivered them. Okay, and when you say delivered them, let's talk about that piece. How would they have done that instead? In a, in a taxi. In a taxi. Or in the back of a car. In a taxi or back of a car they already had, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and what about the, uh, the warehouse and the uh, conveyors and so on? Goods, say, again. say again? Not refrigerated goods, manually picked. Yeah, manually picked. Just go to the supermarket. Just go to the supermarket. Yeah, you don't need to build your warehouse at all to prove the proposition. You just go to the supermarket. So uh, you can think about the most minimal viable pretotyping process is uh, free home shopping delivery, um, uh, ring this number, they phone up, you read me your, um, your shopping list over the phone, I write it down, I go to the shop in my car, I go shopping, I pick it up, I bring it to your house, I hand it over, you give me some cash. Now, it's not exactly a cardo, but it gets you to learn a hell of a lot about whether people value this service at all, whether they're going to be in when you get there, whether the stuff is going to uh, um, uh, package and be delivered well and so on. So had they done that, then there would have been multiple millions of, uh, uh, of dollars of investors' money saved, and you wouldn't have a whole fleet, you wouldn't have a whole fleet of refrigerated vans being sold off in auction uh, in the early 2000s. Okay, next one. Um, Alberto is an Italian, and so he always uh, looks rather um, uh, disgusted by this idea, the idea of Max Spaghetti. Um, but Max Spaghetti did roll out across a large part of the McDonald's franchise uh, some years ago and uh, didn't last very long. So um, let's role play this again. So um, uh, let's assume that McDonald's is pretotyping this. How would that work? Any thoughts? 
Have it on a menu uh, in all the stores. Have it on all the stores menus. Just have it on the store, one store menu, um, but don't have it in stock. Okay, so let's role play this. You're the counter person at McDonald's. You've been promoted. So, uh, um, so I come into the store. I come into McDonald's. Ah, oh, uh, yeah, Max spaghetti. Can I have some of that, please? I'm sorry, I've just run out. But next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we've run out, but next time. Okay, anything else? I'll just log that here. Yeah, okay. So you need to log the quantity of the interest. You might ask them why they've chosen it. Yeah. Um, and then most importantly, because with a couple of these pre-to-typing options, there is a danger that the pre-to-type, whether it's the full store, uh, as is the, I mean, this is effectively a full store, your menu that doesn't have a product behind it. Uh, and some of the other ones may risk disappointing your customer and pissing them off and therefore damaging your ongoing relationship with them. So you need to think very hard about how do you mitigate that and make it a positive experience. So in this case, you might say, I'm really sorry, we haven't got any of the spaghetti, um, but since we're out of stock on that, uh, if you order any, uh, any other meal, I'll give you a free drink. And so you know, that's incredibly cheap versus what you'll learn in this process, and it keeps the customer happy. So I'm afraid I'm a bit, I'm a bit of an insider because I spent time there, and I was in charge of launching the Veggie Deluxe for right. in the UK, yeah. which was a disaster. Yeah. Um, yeah, that <laughs> was a disaster, which is the point I wanted to make here, which was, I mean, that was great there. The problem is, the reason why it was a disaster is because we, in those days it was TV region, so it was easy to test. Let's put it in Granada TV region. Yeah. So you have to make the product and get people to try the product. Okay. And they didn't like it, and more importantly, it fell apart in people's hands. So. And salads as well. So that's the only thing with, with that scenario, you ultimately with a fast food product like that. So let me, let, me, let, me, let me pause you there, because I think you're, yeah. you're, you're doing a brilliant job of taking this story forward. Yeah. So the first thing is you do exactly uh, what was suggested. You put it on the menu yeah. in one store. You figure out if anybody even asks for it. If they don't ask for it, it doesn't matter whether it falls apart because nobody's ever going to have it in their hand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? So you get, and you, get a, you get a nice tally mark to say people have asked for it. Um, next stage then, to your very good point, is then you have to make some. But do you have to go through a whole uh, McDonald's supply chain thing, or do you just have some spaghetti from Waitrose uh, in the back um, of the thing? So let me do, do, let, I'll come back to your point at the end, but let me go with this. So let's assume that you uh, are doing that just in one store, and you're making your spaghetti then. So um, uh, I come and I say, OK, can I have the spaghetti, please? Yes, of course. OK. So, <laughs> now, what's the thing you have to ask me? <laughs> yeah. Why did you choose it? What else? How much are you willing to pay for it? Uh, it's got, it has to be priced because it's on the menu, so there have to be a price. It's been we're doing this for we've been doing this for two, three, four weeks. Have you had it before? Have you had it before? Okay. So you need to know whether there's repeat. Uh, um, assuming that the product that you're selling them is uh, is a good facsimile for the thing that you're actually going to sell in the supply chain, um, and then you need to make sure. Then then you get positive reactions to that. And then you make sure you're making something which is going to be replicable to the wider estate. And then does it f make a mess of their shirt, fall apart in their hands, and so on? So then you learn that piece of it, which Appreciate would save you there. Jumping in as a classic example, we didn't do any of the first thing. Yeah. And we spent a fortune on TV ads and making stuff and saying, you will buy salads, you will buy veggie burgers. Well, no, no, we won't. Yeah, exactly. So you could learn a lot of that in one store yeah, yeah. with a much cheaper process. Uh, but you know that's a, that's a great insight from the from the world there, the real world there. So um, so that's some of the process. Uh, now quickly on the economics. Now this is a little bit uh, sort of stating the obvious, but it's worth just reminding ourselves as why you can't afford not to do this once you're aware of the principle. And your uh, RPI or your return on prototyping investment um, versus prototyping can be quickly looked at like this. So it's a ratio of the learning times the ratio of the cost tells you what your return is on this effort versus an a similar effort in prototyping. So what percentage can you learn from a given prototype compared to the full product or the next best thing versus what you can learn from a, pro sorry, from a prototype versus what you can learn from a prototype? And then what are the relative costs? So if we take an example of this, let's think about our IBM guy. So the learning, sorry, the, the, the cost is more in time here than money. But to do a full prototype where you build this thing and you get it out into market and so on, it you know, might cost you 60 months of effort, certainly to get something that from the day they started that would actually be able to recognize speech and turn it into text in any meaningful way. 
Um, whereas the prototype actually probably took them a couple of weeks, maximum a month. So you've got a massive ratio of 60 to 1 there. So your learning ratio doesn't have to be very good for you to have a massive payback on this initiative. So let's assume that your prototype would give you 50% of the learning versus putting somebody in front of a, a fully functioning thing, um, whereas a good prototype would give you 80%. I think even though that number is generous, but then you can see that your return here is going to be 37x. So there's a 37x improvement in the effort per unit time, sorry, the, the learning per unit time you get from a pre-typing process versus a prototyping process. And if we look at Webvan, here, if we look at the learning first, um, from a, the prototype that we described, you might get you know, 0.75 uh, versus the full-blown launch, which was the only kind of prototype they could do, uh, gives you the full learnings, um, but the cost uh, the prototype, the first launch they had, they spent $100 million on before they delivered the first basket. Um, whereas, you know, you could do it for a tiny fraction of that. You know, the, the ideas that we came up with here of just uh, the phone call and the van would just be hundreds of dollars. But even if you went up to having a, uh, a branded refrigerated delivery van and a simple website, but then actually just did the fulfillment by buying in store, then, you know, for a fraction of a million of millions of dollars, you could do that and get your... Uh, your RPI to be 75x versus what they actually did in the real world. Um, <coughs> now, in terms of success, success metrics, uh, what you probably want to do when you're doing uh, your prototyping analysis is to think about how people come down this funnel. So first of all, you understand what your target market is. Um, and then you take a small representative sample of that. So a small representative sample of uh, McDonald's customers are the people that just come into the uh, Slough McDonald's, okay? Uh, and you present them with your Max Spaghetti menu card. Uh, so they're the ones that are invited to engage with your, with your prototype. Um, so your initial level of interest is the number who actually tried it over the number who invited to try it. So that's uh, your first measure. Um, and so, you know, that's this over this. And then as you're going further down, you look at your ongoing level of interest, the number who are still using it over those who tried it. So in McDonald's, again, the people who came back and said, can I have the Max Spaghetti? Uh, have you ordered it before? Yes, I had it last week. Thank you. So that's your ongoing level. Have you had it more than once? And then you can see whether you've got a terrible decay here. So those are the two measures that you uh, typically want to keep an eye on once you've developed your pre-typing concept to see, uh, see what works. So... What I'd like to do now is to get you to huddle around in groups of uh, five or six and ideally one of you will have a live project right now which you're working on which you can describe in 30 seconds and then get people to brainstorm how you might uh, use a pre-typing approach to get some learnings from that kind of thing rather than building a full-blown full product or website or call centre offering or whatever. Um, if you can't think of anything, then uh, I've got, uh, here's one I prepared earlier, which is, uh, we're running up to Christmas, we all like to have a drink over Christmas, people like to pamper their pets over Christmas. Um, if you were going to launch a brand of dog beer, uh, then you know, the traditional approach would be to uh, design a recipe and a formula and get a bottling contract and get distribution in the stores and launch it out there and see how it's sold. So if you would like to use this example, then think about how you'd prototype dog beer. Uh, the alternative is prototyping a live project that you've got in your own business. Um, and I'll uh, leave uh, these questions up here. So which prototype mode of the ones we went through, the fake door, the Pinocchio, uh, et cetera, um, would you use that would give you the data most quickly and cheaply? Uh, what data do you get? Uh, what are the, the basics of it? Um, how much uh, will early data model the real world? So how much are you compromising between what the real world will tell you versus what your prototype will tell you? Uh, and uh, what could we do next? And I will also hand out these. So on the one side, you've got a little cheat sheet of the six different archetypes of the prototyping approach. And the other side, some of the other things that we've been through. So uh, why don't you just huddle around in your groups of uh, five or six, just do it randomly as you, as you sit. And then we'll spend five minutes on that and then we'll come back and discuss what you talked about at the end. Okay. Oh.
well done. Uh, a great discussion and uh, some great ideas coming back from, uh, from the feedback stuff. So last thing I'll just do is to you know, remind you of the different uh, archetypes. You've all got the handout, and I'll make sure it gets emailed around afterwards so that you can have that electronically and share it with your teams if you want. Um, talking with Charles and Manage about this, is that they said the most useful thing probably out of this is that I'm sure before this session, you'd have Charles and Manage saying, why don't you pre-type that? And you think, well, what the fuck are they talking about? <laughs> uh, and now at least you'll know. Um, uh, we'll jump over that. And there are obviously a bunch of platforms that you'll, you'll be more or less aware of that can help you uh, do some of this stuff. Um, obviously, there's a bunch of Google stuff. But then uh, there's things like the Amazon Mechanical Turk, worth looking into that if you haven't seen that already. Uh, Kickstarter, I'm sure you know about. Um, while AdWords has made it a bit more difficult to use it as a fake door because it uh, much more carefully now looks at the landing page and whether it corresponds to the ad and uses that in the, uh, in the ranking algorithm. Um, you can put uh, YouTube videos up with annotations on them uh, without too much restriction and then measure which annotations with which messages have been clicked on. And then that's a nice way of, uh, uh, of doing a full store type offering. Uh, and then if you're in more of the physical product space, you know, uh, Short Run Packaging does things like this uh, very cheaply and easily. Um, uh, and then you've got um, uh, things like Launch Rock, uh, Balsamic. There are plenty of others that can help you do very quick uh, mock-ups of these kind of things. Or you can just call Louis and he'll do it all for you for very cheap. Um, so uh, if you want to learn more, again, I'll send this around. But um, Alberto's team have got uh, pretotyping.org as a website uh, on there. Um, you can download uh, for free copies of this. I think it's 99 cents for the Kindle version. Um, and there's some other videos uh, of various things there. Um, <coughs> and uh, if you want to go deeper, then uh, either I or potentially Albert or one of his team could do a, a deeper pre typing session for, uh, for one of your teams. So that's pretty much us done. Um, thank you all for being a great group, uh, all your attention. And um, the last thing I say is that uh, I've talked to Charles and Manners quite a lot about how do we get uh, the leadership group of all of the different BC businesses working better together and sharing with each other. And it was fabulous to see the energy around you guys from different parts of the business sharing your ideas with each other around solving real BC problems. So just think about how we can take that energy out of this room and you can carry on working with each other and sharing ideas and, and making sure that um, you know, Phil's ideas and Elliot's challenges are, are being uh, uh, shared together and so on so that we can, um, uh, we can be much stronger as a group of companies than we are as individual businesses. So uh, with that, I'm done. Thank you all very much. Thank you.